Okay, we're going to pick up from where we left off at the last lesson, which had you know the beginning of the civil wars and Rome's Italian allies agitating against her. Um, and this will go on you know, off and on from 91 to 88 BC. Um, in 88 BC, a Roman general named Sulla decides he's going to fix the problems that are causing this. And with his army, he marches on Rome, captures the city, um, kills his enemies, and declares himself dictator. Now, there was a provision for the office of dictator in the Roman Constitution of 509 B.C. Um, the Senate could appoint someone dictator um, in times of crisis when they needed quick decisions and they um, didn't have time to go through the whole parliamentary legislative process. But the position was only supposed to last for six months. Um, as you can see from the slide, Sulla abdicates, you know, in 79 B.C., you know, which is basically eight years and six months longer than he's supposed to be in, the, in, in power. Um, but he supposedly re totally reorganizes the Constitution, updates it, modernizes it, you know, supposedly fixes everything that needs to be fixed, and then having done what he believes he needs to do, he steps down in dicta uh, as dictator in 79 B.C., supposedly creating a, a new Republican form of government. Um, uh, the reality is he set a dangerous precedent. If you were a general in the Roman army, Sulla has now successfully captured Rome and set himself up as something like a monarch, and your point of view gets to be, if Sulla can do it, I can do it too. Um, and the reality is, as we move into the 60s BC, real power in Rome is going to devolve upon three men, all of whom are generals. Um, here's a picture of Sulla, I mean, I, um, just so you can see um, what he looked like. Um, and, you know, the person that eventually ends up dominating is Julius Caesar, um, who is part of what is referred to as the first triumvirate. And there's these three men that make up this three-man rule. And the, the three people that are in the first triumvirate um, are Pompey the Great, Julius Caesar, and Crassus. And they're the ones who pretty much control Rome after Sulla. Um, Caesar is an up-and-comer, but he isn't quite the big name yet. Pompey is the really big name in this. He's the well-known person. They sort of divide control of the area of, of all the areas Rome controls between the three of them. Pompey's power base is in the east. Um, Caesar is sort of shuttled off to what is today France, um, which is called by the Romans Gaul at that point, um, because you know he is so ambitious and they think he sort of can't make too much trouble there. Crassus pretty much you know is, has Italy. Um, but in the end, Caesar ends up dominating this, and he actually takes what could have been, you know, anonymous exile in Gaul and turns it into his favor. Um, he proceeds to attempt to add Gaul to the Roman possessions by fighting the various Celtic tribes that are there and, and by and large winning them. And not only that, he, he creates a good marketing campaign around it. Um, he dictates accounts of his campaigns um, and then has these accounts published in Rome. Um, they are, are eventually referred to as Caesar's Commentaries on the Gallic Wars, and they're a masterpiece of marketing. Um, at no point does the pronoun I ever appear in this thing. Um, it's all supposed to look like it's third person. And so, you know, what you, you know, following the rule of good advertising, which is repetition, 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 what you hear all the time are things like Caesar did this, Caesar did that. You know, um, in the heat of battle when the enemy seemed to be winning and the forces seem to be faltering. Caesar made this decision that helped to save the day. And you can't sort of miss the whole Caesar, Caesar, Caesar flashing all over the place like a, a big giant neon sign. Um, and it does enhance his popularity. He even briefly attempts to invade um, what is today England to go after some of the Celtic tribes there that are helping their, um, you know, their allies in, in Gaul itself. But he's eventually run out of there. Um, and he's getting very, very popular with the people. And this tends to make Pompey and, and, and Crassus very, very worried. Um, here's a picture of um, a bust of Pompey. Um, I sort of like this one. I always kind of laugh when I see it because he kind of looks like he's drunk if you look at his eyes. Um, and here's his main rival, Julius Caesar. Um, and, you know, Caesar is making a name for himself, and they're, they're getting worried. Um, Eventually, conflict breaks out between Caesar and Pompey, which causes more civil war. Worried that Caesar might pull a, pull a Sulla and march on Rome, Pompey and Crassus issue an order to um, Caesar saying he's not to bring his troops 
um, out of Gaul in, in across the Italian Alps and into Italy. They say if he crosses, brings his troops across the Rubicon River, they will consider it an act of war and they will go after him. Well, Caesar hasn't spent all this time conquering Gaul just to, you know, sort of cower before Pompey. So, of course, he crosses the Rubicon River, uh, defeats the forces of Crassus, and eventually in 45 D BC um, meets Pompey and his forces, and they are defeated. Um, Pompey um, does what every good defeated Roman does when they lose a battle. Um, he falls on his sword. Again, they really like sharp things and killing people with them in Rome. Um, so Caesar is the last one standing, and he does pull a Sulla. He names himself dictator. Um, there does seem to be some evidence that he was angling for something more, that he was looking to be a king. There are some stories that several times with his friend Mark, Mark Antony, he was on a balcony, the crowd was cheering him and his accomplishments, and at the same time, at the, you know, he attempts to put a crown on his head twice, and the crowd gets restive and upset, and he sort of laughs it off, and so on like this. Um, Eventually, the patricians decide that Caesar is dangerous, that he is setting himself up as a tyrant and possibly a king. A conspiracy to get rid of Caesar is formed um, by the patricians. And on March 15th, 44 BC, while going to the Senate to lay out a, um, a plan for some reforms in Rome and, and new campaigns, um, the crowd is infiltrated by the, the assassins and Caesar is stabbed to death over 20 times. Um, and in the end, Caesar was assassinated because the patricians in the Senate believed he was a tyrant. This was the reason um, they went after him. Um, the assassination does nothing but set off another civil war. Um, because Caesar was very, very popular and you know, people didn't like it. And eventually you see a new three-man ruling group um, come into power whose initial purpose is to avenge the death of Caesar, of Julius Caesar. Um, Caesar is sort of outsmarted his opponents by already filing his will, and he names his 18-year-old adopted grandnephew Octavian to be his heir. Um, and Octavian, working with Mark Antony, um, Caesar's closest friend and most talented general, and another main na man named Lepidus, they create the um, second triumvirate, whose purpose is to find and defeat the Caesar's murderers, which they do at the Battle of Philippi. And all of them, the, the losing side, the, the conspirators fall on their swords after they lose. Um, with Caesar's murderers out of the way, the common bond that had kept them together um, slowly starts to unravel. And eventually you see Antony and Octavian coming into conflict. Antony is older. He had been Julius Caesar's friend. He was an experienced general. He honestly believes that he should be sort of the, the driving force behind this. Octavian's point of view is that although he's younger and not necessarily a military commander, his, his uncle had named him as his heir, and he should be the, um, the driving force behind this. And conflict you know, over who's going to be the dominant person in the triumvirate you know, grows and grows over the next several years. Um, Antony, like Pompey, had his primary source of power within um, the Eastern Mediterranean, and eventually he makes an alliance with the most powerful non-Roman ruler in the Eastern Mediterranean, the last of the Ptolemaic rulers of Egypt, um, Cleopatra. Cleopatra has her own agenda, um, which is she wants to, she realizes that Rome is the rising power and she can't keep Egypt from somehow coming under the influence and control of Rome, but she does want to keep herself and her family on the throne. And that means she's got to make a choice between Antony and Octavian. Um, Octavian seems to be the better choice. He seems to understand the way politics is done in the Eastern world and in the Hellenistic kingdom. So um, she allies herself with uh, um, Antony. She had already allied herself with Julius Caesar, who, although uh, he was married, apparently did engage in an affair with him. Um, Cleopatra's reputation has gotten pretty trashed by Octavian. Um, who likes to portray her as a conniving, manipulative, sort of nymphomaniac slut, basically. Um, and he portrays Antony as a man who is ambitious and is in control of his passions and desires and lets himself be manipulated by Cleopatra and you know, being involved in a romantic affair with her in the same way Julius Caesar had. Um, basically, Cleopatra, in my opinion, is a good female ruler. And like all rulers, she uses all the arsenals that are in her um, the weapons that are in her arsenal to achieve her ends and being a female ruler, sex is going to be one of those weapons. 
Um, she uses it with Caesar. Um, the legend has it that she has herself wrapped, um, wearing nothing. She has herself wrapped in a, a, a carpet and has the carpet delivered to Caesar and has the carpet unrolled, and there she is in all her glory in front of Caesar. He does have an affair with her, does briefly set her up at her own place in Rome until um, the rather prudish Romans you know, don't approve of the married Caesar um, doing this, so he, she has to go back to Egypt. She does have a son by Caesar, Julius Caesar, um, and eventually after Caesar's death, she connects with Octavian, does have a, a personal and professional relationship with Octavian, I mean not Octavian, with Antony, um, and eventually, you know, an alliance is formed between the two, and they, you know, make their bid to, to move Octavian out, but unfortunately in 31 BC, um, Octavian's forces, led by his um, talented general Marcus Agrippa, defeat Antony and Cleopatra at the Battle of Actium. Um, Antony, having lost, falls on his sword, like all good Roman soldiers do. The legend has it that Cleopatra, realizing that Antony is dead and that she has no protection from um, Octavian, who's going to bring her back to Rome, run her through a triumphal parade through the streets of Rome, and then have her publicly executed, which she can't, you know, would not stand for as a, as a ruling queen of Egypt, um, has her, um, one of her ladies in waiting bring in an asp, which is one of the more poisonous snakes in the world, and she forces its mouth open and presses it to her chest, um, forcing it to bite her, and thus she dies. Um, she is the last of the Ptolemaic rulers. Octavian will bring, um, you know, Egypt directly under Roman rule and appoint a Roman governor for it and not allow any other um, ruler you know, a client ruler in there. Um, in the pictures here, in the top left-hand corner, you see a, you know, a recreation of Antony and what he looked like. Um, next to that is a statue of Octavian, um, who eventually will be known as Augustus Caesar. Um, and at the bottom, you know, what we think is the, the, the most realistic representation of, of Cleopatra. Um, so you can sort of see the three parties involved. Now, after he um, wins the civil wars, the Roman Senate is so grateful to Octavian for finally ending the civil wars and bringing peace that they give him a whole bunch of titles. One of the titles they grant him is the title of Augustus, from a title which had formerly been reserved for the gods. So pretty much after 30 BC, Octavian is no longer referred to as Octavian. He's referred to as Augustus Caesar. So when I start saying Augustus at this point, um, I'm talking about Octavian. He's just generally referred to by that title um, after 30 BC. And he tries to do again what Sulla did. He you know, resets up you know, supposedly a, a republican form of government. He reestablishes the republic, but he makes sure not to give the Senate power equal to his own. Um, primary jobs of the Senate are going to be to administer the provinces. They're the ones who are going to appoint the royal governors. Um, and everything like that, and to, to do a lot of the administration of the provinces. They're to be the chief deliberative body in the state. In the end, it's going to be Augustus that makes the actual final decision, but he's smart enough to give them a lot of input into how it's going and let them debate um, and, you know, look like he's seriously considering, you know, their things. And usually some of the things they suggest are, are put into his final policy, so they feel like they're involved and everything like that. He's one of those rare leaders that comes along that gets the legislature to do pretty much everything he wants, and they all walk out of the building thinking it's their idea. Uh, and one of the last things they will do is they will act as a court of law uh, as well. But they don't have nearly the power that they used to have under Augustus. You know, you know essentially um, what he creates is kind of a, a constitutional dictatorship. Augustus is considered to be the first emperor of the Roman Empire. He himself never takes the title of emperor because he knows how uncomfortable the Senate and the patricians and the people as a whole are with the idea of a king. So he comes up with a title that makes it sound like he's not a king, even though he really is. The title he takes for himself is princeps Cibitatus, sometimes reduced just to princeps. Um, that translates into English as the first citizen of the state. So he's sort of trying to create this illusion that he is no different than anyone else who is considered a, a Roman citizen. He's just the citizen who is sort of the CEO of the government on this one. In the end, his control of the army was the main basis of his power. It never went into battle um, except under his authority. Uh, he pays them. He gives them the pensions. Um, because he's very successful, 
um, because he appoints good people to help lead the army. The army remains loyal to him, and he has a nice long reign. He doesn't die until 14 AD. Um, but the basic flaw in this system is still is that Augustus and his successors don't fix the basic um, problem the Romans have always had um, coming out of the Punic Wars, which is the relationship between the army and the emperor, who is now the head of the army, is personal. And as long as they like the emperor, they are very, very loyal to him. The moment they dislike the emperor, which will happen with the third emperor, um, Caligula, they have absolutely no problem in the army in getting rid of them and replacing them with someone else. Um, you know, this third emperor, Caligula, is actually stabbed by the Praetorian Guard, his own bodyguard coming down from the gladiatorial games, which then picks another general, Claudius, to be the new emperor. And, you know, getting the army loyal to the state rather than to the person of the emperor is a problem that is never solved. However, Augustus does put the empire on a firm footing, and for the next 200 years, there will be relative peace throughout all of the areas controlled by the Roman Empire. And this 200 years of peace that is initiated by Augustus is known in Latin as the Pax Romana, which means Roman peace. In terms of the provinces themselves, there's not a huge amount of new acquisition of territory under um, Augustus. Um, there is some fighting. He does expand some into northern and western Europe. But in the end, there was a pragmatic purpose behind this expansion. Um, his... His, his expansion was built around the idea of finding defensible borders for the empire. And so, you know, it's not just a huge land grab. It's finding areas that are, you know, finding borders that are easily de defended from the various barbarians. And this last slide I have before you in this unit is what sort of Rome's going to look like, you know, at a certain point well after Augustus' death, but going into the second century AD. And you can see that it's changed. This is a model. You can see that it's changed from, you know, a city that has a few marble buildings or stone buildings and a lot of huts into what we would be considered a major metropolis. Um, sort of up in one corner, you see the what we call the Colosseum, what was called the Flavian Amphitheater. Um, sort of down from that, you will see the Circus Maximus, this oval thing where chariot races were done. Um, sort of to the left of the of the Colosseum, you will see the, the Forum, which is where the Senate building was located and everything like this. But this has become a major city. And it is said of Augustus that when he comes to comes to power, he found city, uh, finds a city made of wood. By the time he dies, he founds a city that is made of stone. Um, so this is what Rome starts beginning, the sort of the grand look that we sort of associate with the Roman Empire. Um, that's where we're leaving for the Roman emperors at the moment. Um, our next lesson is going to look at another portion of the empire, um, the Jewish kingdom of Judea, um, and the, the life and ministry of Jesus, and um, the history of the early Christian church. Um, have a good day, and I will see you next lesson.